morning, everybody. I'm uh, Zanny Minton Beddoes from The Economist, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this panel, this incredibly important panel, Free and Equal, Standing Up for Diversity. Uh, you may know that we at The Economist uh, have been championing the case for equal rights and against discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity for a long time. Uh, 1996 was the first year that we put the case for gay marriage on our cover, um, a time when it was not legal really anywhere very much. And it's amazing how things have changed. Um, we've come a long way. We've come a long way. This is the third year, I think, that there is a session on LGBT uh, issues in the Congress Center. I think in 1996, that would have been utterly unimaginable. <laughs> so things have improved dramatically, but we have not come far enough. I think you would probably all agree that there is a huge amount still to do, a huge amount uh, to do so that we are no longer having to make the case for equal rights and against discrimination. So what I think of uh, this session as being is a way station on that, uh, on that long road. Uh, and I hope uh, we can have a full and frank conversation. We have three terrific panelists um, to give us a sense of where we have come to and what still needs to be done. And I don't think any of my distinguished panelists really need an introduction, but just very briefly, Zaid Rad Al Hussein, who is the UN Commissioner for Human Rights and has done so much work on this. The, uh, the Free and Equal campaign, you just told me, is the, the biggest and most successful campaign in UN history, so congratulations on that. Next to Zaid is Vittorio Colau, the Chief Executive of Vodafone, who has um, been an extraordinary leader in this space, as I think you will, you will hear. And next to him, Jin Ching, uh, a woman who needs no introduction, um, but she is an extraordinary woman. The, uh, uh, founder of the Jinjing Dance Theater. She's the, called often the, the Oprah of China. Uh, she just told me her TV show has 150 million viewers, which is uh, <laughs> no small number. Um, she is, as, as you know, probably, the, uh, the first person in China, first trans woman to be officially recognized as such by the government. Yes. Uh, an amazing story, and I hope you'll, you'll tell us and tell us uh, how you have, you know, you not only... Um, you embody that change, but you have also you know, pushed this agenda very uh, effectively in a country where it's not always easy to do so. So I'm delighted to be joined by the three of you. I'm going to start, actually, Zaid, with you. Um, can you give us a sort of stock take of where we've got to and what you think are the biggest challenges lying ahead? Mm. Well, thank you, Zani. And uh, you called me commissioner, and I'm supposed to be the high commissioner. Many countries used to call me High Commissioner until so I sorry. criticized them. And then they stopped calling me High I'm and just referred to me as Commissioner. Some would rather call me Low Commissioner. <laughs> so For the I'm record, joking. I apologize. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. High Commissioner no, no, for no, Human Rights. <laughs> no, the, uh, as you said, uh, over the last few decades, we've seen enormous progress. And most recently from Ireland to Chile to, uh, to Australia, where societies themselves have, have from uh, bottom up, basically take, taken this issue uh, to heart. And, and in countries where you would have thought that it wouldn't have been possible, in Ireland, and now, of course, they have a, a prime minister who's gay, that these sorts of changes would still be far off in, in the making. And so these dramatic gains have filled us with hope that uh, this is an unstoppable force. But as you alluded, it's, it's not, that uns uh, not that unstoppable because as more and more people feel the environment change and feel the confidence uh, to come out, we begin to see again a resurgence of a homophobic expression. We begin to see uh, cyberbullying in schools continue to, or let's say they begin, they ebb and then they climb again. Uh, we see high suicide rates among adolescents who feel the effects of that. And, and ultimately what we grasp from all of this is that it is a struggle that has to be fought every single day. And even in those countries where these gains have been substantial, uh, we cannot be complacent. And if we abide ourselves to that way of thinking, one feels that in the end uh, we will get there and we will reduce the discrimination, uh, hopefully to extremely low, low levels, if not eliminate them, uh, you know, by may hopefully the middle of the century. Uh, and, and we need the power of corporate, the corporate sector to help us. And indeed, in the presence of Vittorio, 
uh, we see companies more and more picking this up and realizing that it's not just a good thing for business, it's the right thing to do uh, as, uh, as human beings. Well, Victoria, I'll get to you in a minute, but first I'm going to ask Jin Ching, can you give us a sense of your own personal experience and what, what it's like in China now? You know, the world's most second populous country, it's clearly enormously important what happens uh, in China for the LGBT agenda, for, for the rights of gay people, trans people. You know, is the glass half full or half empty and how much of a difference are you making personally? Oh, I don't know. I just say it's the situation is getting better. I think if uh, 20 years ago, if you are gay or LGBT group, you are so scared to telling people mm. and share the experience with people. But now young people have no adult to share the feeling with a friend, mm. even with the families. But we come out of the closet, still a big issue in China. Mm. Mm. So I, I remember three years ago, I, I have my own talk show. I was an interview expert on the LGBT group and are talking about how to come out as a closet. Mm. And I record it. After I recording, mm. just before I finish the talk interview, my TV producer come up to me, said, Madam Jean, you need to make one more sentence. I said, which sentence? LGBT group never e existing in China. Mm. I said, stop it. Mm. I said, how you as a producer can ask me to say that words? Because I, I didn't say the final words. Mm. Then the show would stop didn't Broadcast they, it. They didn't broadcast it. Yeah. Mm. Actually, in a way, the situation is changing. The attitude is quite positive, but the action from society turning to the LGBT group is still very slow. Mm. That's a different situation in China. In the 30 years ago, China very closed. Mm. We do have LGBT group existing, but the Chinese culture is we don't talk about it. Mm. Everything underneath. Mm. That's part of a Chinese culture. Mm. After China is open to the Western world, everything coming up the table and each group become labelized. Mm. That's make Chinese extremely nervous. Mm. I can give you an example. 20 years ago, if you two young men holding a hand, mm. walk on the street, people treat them just like they are good friends, they are good bodies. Mm. Don't think no more. Mm. But now if you think a two boy holding on hand, everybody immediately, are they a gay or partner? Mm. <laughs> this becomes oversensitive. Mm. So in a way it's good, we can talk about it. Mm. In other way, we're over alert. Mm. I don't think you're good or not or bad. <laughs> Do we have a gay people in an ancient culture? Yes, in China, we have huge cultural, mm. deep culture, we have everything. Mm. Just we don't talk about it. Mm. That's why in Chinese always singing the Beatles songs, let it be. <laughs> <laughs> but in these days, everything becomes so categorized and so sensitive, everybody more alert. But in a way, it's good. I think the situation, be more attention to the way young people, new generation of Chinese young people, very brilliant. I can see that that was this second year for me. I can see the young generation, the global, uh, what's that? Young global leaders? Yes, they are, I, I was talking last night to two young people. They are brilliant. I think in China, heading to these directions, it's good. But of course, now we're still part of, majority part of it, still conservative. So how this open up, give little time. I have confidence in the future, but they need more time. We'll need more time. Exactly, yeah. Victoria, turning to you, you are, as I said earlier, and, and I wasn't trying to flatter you, a pioneer in, in this area, as a, in, in the corporate world. Why are you doing this? And what is the goal? I mean, how are you going to measure success for Vodafone's LGBT activities? What is, the, what is your goal? What is your role within the broader push for equality and anti-discrimination? So first of all, you're wrong. <laughs> Do you know, Victoria always says this to me, it's pretty much everything I say. Because I, I'm not an extraordinary leader, and here I represent the corporate world, so I'm, I'm speaking to my fellow CEOs. Yeah. I'm, I've been kicking myself for the last three years, saying to myself, how could I not see this before? So, extraordinary leader, to be honest. Okay, extraordinary leader who came it's, late to the party. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I, tell you, I tell you why. So, a couple of things. Um, and again, we have to be careful sometimes how we fool ourselves. 89% of the Vodafone employees feel fine in expressing their uh, you know, gender, identity, sexuality. Is that good or bad? It's pretty bad. Because it means that when I have a meeting with 10 people, there is at least one who does not feel comfortable. Now, how about that? How many meetings of 10 people do I have? How many times in my life have I thought, oh my God, somebody, one, even one. Make it 5%. It means that when we have a management meeting of 300 people, every CEO 
should think. I have 300 of my top people here, 15 mm. don't feel comfortable. Is that a good thing? Mm. So I, I, I'm really, can, three years ago I said, there's something wrong here. I mean, we are not seeing something that is not, so we might be better than others, but in absolute, it's not, uh, mm. it's not good. 70% of the uh, people that feel fine in a university environment mm. to express their sexuality and their gender identity freely, when they come into the corporate world, they go silent. Yeah. Mm. And why? And, and then so we started talking to my colleagues and asking questions, and you start hearing stories, you know, uh, we collect money for uh, the wedding of colleagues, but nobody collected money for my wedding. They said congratulations, and that's it. Is that right? How does mm. this person feel? Just because he's gay and he has a gay marriage, he's not entitled to have a gift from the colleagues. I mean, all these things must be terrible inside. Mm. So, that's why I said, listen, you know, I believe in human rights. I believe in everybody should feel really mm. good in a work environment. My job, and here I'm really saying our job as CEOs mm. is to make sure that our environments are environments where everybody feels mm. free to express mm. himself, herself, whatever, mm -hmm. in, uh, in a proper way. So uh, I think uh, the, the reason why I did it is because I want to get 100%. So, so I want to really get to 100%. Give us a sense of what you've done, or, or perhaps make it broader. What are the, the, the right ways that you can and companies can show well, leadership? Uh, here, there's two complexities. One, multi-country. I operate in countries where I have legal restrictions, if not even worse, mm. uh, in, uh, uh, in dealing uh, with LGBT issues. And the first challenge is, of course, would be fantastic to get legislation everywhere to be consistent and friendly and protective, because you mentioned China. I mean, we had a colleague in the Netherlands who last year, mm. just because was holding hand in, in the street, has been beaten up. In the Netherlands, a place that everybody thinks is, you know, very mm. tall and so on. Mm. And we had a CEO and my, all my executive team, we had to express very strongly, very visibly, our support and solidarity for that. So, first, you really need to work to get laws changed. It's very touchy, very sensitive culturally. You need to do it in an intelligent way, but you need to do it. Second, what we did, we said, let's adopt the embassy concept. Our company is like an embassy. We respect the laws of the country, mm -hmm. but inside my company, I'm extraterritorial mm -hmm. on this topic, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. on everything. I cannot mm -hmm. be on everything. <laughs> so uh, I cannot mention the countries, literally. And you know, my briefing says, don't mention countries, please. You go in trouble. Mention them. <laughs> they will mention them. You give the description. There are, countries, <laughs> there are countries where we had to take proactive actions to protect people. Some, in one case, very sad even to transfer international and help to explain to the local people and have a, a good debate. Mm -hmm. And then I have to say the best thing that we did is the most stupid thing that again, I would really encourage every CEO to do and is a practical thing that we were recommending and I want to show it. This is my badge to go around the company and mm. you know, I have this thing, LGBT and Friends Network. When I, again, I've been stupid. When they told me, Vittorio, why don't you wear this in your badge? I said, this is just uh, you know, symbolic. It will be taken as PR. Mm. And people said, no, 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 you don't realize mm. the power of this. So, you know, I go around the company like this, mm. and I was stopped. I'm stopped by colleagues who say, Vittorio, thank you. Just you wearing this in the elevator mm. sends such a great signal that we can open the debate. Mm. And, and, and that is what I would encourage, you know, all companies to do, signal that you want to have the debate. Mm. And then you will sort out the countries where it's difficult, you will find the embassy, you will do. But just signaling that the mm. top of the company, the executive mm. committee is sensitive, opens a debate that will then lead to a wonderful solution and eventually to the 100% I feel comfortable. Mm. In Qing, you have a huge platform um, in China, but in a country where it is difficult to use that platform to its fullest extent. Tell us how you, what it, how have you been able to use your TV program and how do you see that as a vehicle for pushing debate? Well, actually I can frankly tell you, our government don't like any aspect of activities, you know. But I also I get some, because in China, you know, we don't have a Facebook, I have a Chinese Weibo, like Chinese Twitter. I have 11 million followers every day. Then they ask me, why don't you in your position do mom see more and do more of the LGBT group? I said, I'm standing there with my Chinese passport. I have many, many times can change my passport 
with my German husband. But I said, no, standing there in China, front of the TV, front of the stage, already mean a lot. I don't need a fighting, raising my hands, like, fighting right, no, no, not yet. Just give some time. That's the, the attitude, positive attitude turning to say, through my TV, through my theater acting, through my dance performance, everything already speaking out for the LGBT group. Mm -hmm. You, instead of you're asking the environment perfectly healthy, you have a strong surviving uh, you know, environment, you just uh, trust yourself. Mm -hmm. You do the right choices. Mm -hmm. And change. I can tell you frankly, 1995, when I was 28 years old, from the best male dancer become a best female dancer, and bring the contemporary dance modern to China. Then the day I out of the hospital, always think I can see invisible enemy or discrimination or prejudice and all the back turning to it. Then I said, I gave myself a bottom line. I said, if I, my bottom line is nobody hurt me physically, mm. that'd be fine. Then mm. I will use my power a drive, changing their attitude. I do the right choices. Mm. I often through my TV talk to the young people, gay people, lesbian. I said, look, mm. we have an example about the rainbow. Mm. Rainbow doesn't come out every day. Mm. Always up the center, strong, big rain, and you have a rainbow. And the people preach it that moment. Mm. That moment very treacherous. Mm. But you have to wait, mm. be patient. Same thing. Mm. In the whole society, you have to give you right. The most important thing, you're confident with yourself. Your positive attitude will be changing the people around you. Then I don't think, uh, also another metaphor, I, I'll talk to Chinese mm. young people today, don't think uh, I'm a special, I need a special treatment. No, you are normal. Mm. We are normal, we are not special, we are normal. Behave normal, asking normal, then society will treat you normal. Don't treat me always like a minority. I need a special treatment. Don't ask me for that. I'm just like, my sexuality may be different from you, but I'm just like you. Don't treat me different. I'm equally respect, normal person. Mm. This attitude needs changing. Don't hide fighting for, we are minorities, need a more special, you know, no, attention, no, we are normal. Mm. If you cannot, uh, my attitude, I'm joking with Molly and said, in my case, you understand my changing my choices, I appreciate it. If you don't get it, next slide. <laughs> 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 you raised a very important question there, a very important and, and tricky issue, which is how much, and you, you mentioned the word wait several times, and change will come, and attitudes will change. And I think there is a, and you said earlier said uh, rightly that there was in some places now a backlash at the pace of change, and people felt that change was happening too fast, and we certainly see that in some parts of the United States mm -hmm. and on some of these issues. Mm -hmm. How do you, in your mind, when you're, you have the, the free and equal campaign, how do you wait, or how do you think about the pace with which you should be pushing? And, you know, I, d I doubt there is any, you might would be surprised if there's any disagreement in this room about the direction and the goals, but simply the pace of change. What, you know, should, do you think there is a case that sometimes going more slowly gets you, you, you get more acceptance? What, how do you well, do, deal with that? I mean, the absolute position of a, of a minority, or let's say of the LG, uh, LGBTIQ uh, uh, community in a country could be terrible. But if the delta, if the vector begins to be positive, then we can work with that particular uh, country. I, in other communities, if you, we took the case of Grozny or what was happening in Chechnya recently, I mean, those who are being hunted down <laughs> and suffering grievously from the actions both of the local authorities but also their own communities, uh, they need help almost instantaneously. And the reactions we saw on the part of the international media and uh, ourselves and the various major human rights organizations, I think was something that they welcomed and they, they couldn't uh, basically fight this battle alone. Um, and so it very much depends on the context. Uh, and in other uh, countries, we see, I mean, the 2.8 billion people uh, living in the 70 countries that effectively have, have made uh, being gay, uh, lesbian, bisexual, uh, trans, or intersex uh, illegal, um, it, you have variations. You have, in some countries, they're being hunted down, uh, as we've seen in, in Uganda and, and Tanzania and so forth. Uh, in other countries, the, the laws are on the books, but the, at, the environment is rather benign. And there's no prosecutorial strategy to, to try and actually bring people to court. Um, 
And then in, in others, we see you know, slow societal change that we need to foster and we need to try and fertilize and make them realize uh, uh, how uh, the world is changing and they have to, to change with it. Uh, I find the, the publication uh, by Open Society of uh, this, uh, the, the cities that are most open and accepting uh, uh, and tolerant uh, of the LGBT community are the cities that, uh, you know, not surprisingly, are doing very well when it, come, it comes to attracting the uh, investments required to have uh, uh, um, uh, a sort of uh, a tech, uh, make them a, a center for technology and, and, uh, and, and the sort of um, the, the cornerstones for the economies of tomorrow. It's not surprising to us. So I, it very much depends on context. In, in overall terms, though, you know, we are all humans. The only qualification to uh, your entitlement of your rights is only that. Mm. And uh, the way in which society works is that uh, very brave people in societies that don't want to change start a movement which then reaches a tipping point and then it becomes a struggle over time. Eventually, we see progress making gains and success. But Victoria, I, I saw you animated in your response as Aid was speaking. Do you, do you agree with that? And do you, you talked about the embassy model, and that's a very um, you know, sensible strategy for you as a company, but your customers span, I would imagine, you know, the whole spectrum of acceptance of social change. So do you think, think that you, you, do you see yourself as having a sort of proselytizing role as a company too? Yes, and uh, I, I have to have a slightly different opinion because I'm an autocratic executive. I can do, I have power, I can do what I want. But then I have to decide. A self-effacing. Self but then I have to decide, do I exercise it? And then maybe I have a backfire and I have the opposite effect or not. So I can do more, but, I, and, and, and the question in my mind is always, okay, or in our mind when we have our discussion, do we push or not? Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you two things that I really recommend my, I hope that somebody will carry this message to other CEOs. There are two things that are very important. The reason why, again, it's important to be visible is that you start talking and you find surprising things. Again, one country which supposedly is difficult is Turkey, but in reality, in Turkey, we are actually making progress. Why? Because we started the dialogue and then you liaise with other companies and then you start talking and then there is no reaction. And then if there is no reaction, you get more courage. Mm. And if there is more courage, there is less reaction. <laughs> so yeah. I don't want to say I want to push the boundaries a bit because it would be arrogant and it depends a lot. And I, I completely agree with you. Be careful because you could really actually yeah. hurt people. This is a ma an area where yeah. you can create real damage if you don't do it right. <laughs> But by starting having the dialogue, you understand how much you can push. Mm -hmm. And this is, I believe, very important. The, the, the second thing which uh, uh, we, 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 we found uh, uh, comforting, I would say, or, or, or give us mm -hmm. courage, is that by having this dialogue starting into the inside the company, you understand what the problem is. Again, I, before this meeting, I talked mm -hmm. to our, uh, the leader of our LGBT group. <laughs> because I wanted to be prepared. And he, said, and he told me, listen, you know, another country in here, I cannot really mention this country, where we had a problem, <laughs> for example, for the usual and famous discussion about bathrooms or toilets. And there was a conflict. And the, uh, the leader of our LGBT group said, it was very interesting because there was a conflict. We managed to talk to both parties, let's say. So the, the conflict within the, the company. Yeah, the usual issue, uh, can I go into the other, why are you here, what do you do here, and so on. Mm. And actually, uh, my, my colleague told me, actually, it was very interesting because talking to the other parties, actually, we explained a lot. And suddenly, the issue was understood, and both point of views were understood much better, and then they started discussing. So I'm a great fan of saying, as a CEO, I need to help the dialogue start inside the company, like in an embassy, which you know is protected, so that then you understand in a better way the local sensitivity and how much you can push mm -hmm. the boundaries. And the only, this only happens if the CO happens. I've been warned 600 times by my colleagues, be careful, don't do that. And then you find out it's not difficult, yeah. actually. 
it is very easy. Most people are really good and want to talk about these things. I'm going to open for questions in just a second, but one last subject that I wanted you, Zaid, to exactly elaborate on, because you, you mentioned it to me before the session came started, and I thought it was really interesting that you said that actually, um, if you looked at LGB issues, mm. Mm. Uh, North America and Western Europe had been sort of, in many ways, leading the way, yeah. but that actually, if you looked at trans yeah. and transgender, Asia was really a much more accepting place. Could you elaborate on that yeah. a bit? Because I think that's something that may not be very broadly known. Yeah. No, it, it's it's really quite extraordinary. We, the, the more we uh, try to understand the, re the, the global dynamics, it's exactly that, that we found in, in Asian society, the, culturally, there was a greater acceptance of trans uh, people. And, and yet the LGB community was, uh, was in some countries underground, uh, not yet sort of able to express itself for fear of uh, persecution. Um, and uh, in Europe, what we found, and um, a recent study in the US also, uh, had it that nine out of 10 uh, Americans, and I think it's probably the same for Europeans, would know at least one gay person, uh, but uh, would not know a trans person. Um, and so if only we can use this to convince uh, more uh, Westerners to be uh, accepting as tra uh, transgender persons were, be were coming out, to, to give them the sort of enabling environment and the make them feel, as um, was just said, that they are absolutely normal and entitled to feel the, the, the sort of warmth of a normal relationship, uh, we could use this then and go to uh, Asia as well and say, look, you know, here you are progressive when it comes to trans, where Western Europe and the United States and elsewhere are not. Uh, so can't you just reverse this now and look at LGB people and, and uh, modify your thinking on this? And so like that, we, you know, we could make some significant gains. That, yes, go in ahead. some part of Asian culture, maybe not particularly in China or uh, among the Asian cultural, somehow they're separating the trans culture and LGB group. Mm. For my case, mm. when I changing my last operation, I asked my father go to local police registration and change my identity card from male to female. Then my father, very conservative military officer, mm. bring my identity card, go to local police station, said, look, my son will become my daughter. And the police woman said, oh, no, we never have the case. We never have the case in our town, in the history. And my father said, history start now. <laughs> <laughs> then they look at my picture. My, <laughs> my father showed the picture, my picture to the police woman. She said, oh, she's so pretty. They're changing it. <laughs> <laughs> For the idea is I need something correction. Because I didn't feel right, I was a man, I need to correct myself. I, I make the step, that's correct choices, then changing it. In some of the mentality matter exists. And, and do, you th do you agree, Zay, that, that it is perhaps e more easily accepted by people than being gay? Is there a... In a way, that's in a way it is. But somehow they find, like right now in China, it's a very interesting situation. Now in China, most of trendy words for young people among the, you know, WeChat, which I said, you want to be fashionable? Yes, if you want to be the fashion circle, you want to be into the fashion circle, you better have a minimum one gay or lesbian friend. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't have that, you're not a fashion at all. <laughs> and you know, the China next month, in the three weeks in China, so giant transportation, Chinese New Year, a lot of young people going back home, facing their parents. Parents, the first question asking, do you have a fiance or boyfriend? Are you engaged? Uh, a lot of gay people, uh, friend, lesbian friend, they're sharing. Can you go home with me? Just pretend you're my boyfriend, you're my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that kind of kind lie exists in Chinese culture. Mm -hmm. But parents know that. They give more, a few more years. If the boy or the daughter still not, not engaged in marriage, they know, okay, maybe my children are gay or lesbian. And the parents are preparing to accepting the mm -hmm. new situation. Mm -hmm. That's all about Chinese culture. You have to give parents distance. It's nothing completely forbidden. Just give more time. Mm -hmm. In Shanghai People's Park, we have a one corner. Every Sunday, parents are looking for the future daughter in Los Angeles, the circle. Mm -hmm. But another corner, the gay parents also, they have the right standing there. My boy needs a boyfriend, a husband. <laughs> to their beginning was a little bit conflict. For the, um, not among the people, among the authorities. So, oh, no, no, we're not long. But now more and more relaxed. Yeah. 
we don't talk about it, but everything is slowly happening. Sure. That's with the Chinese tolerance, you know, in the history, in the culture. In a way, I think the situation is much better. So I don't need the fighting. Oh, we need the right, right. Right, is, this word is very sensitive. Mm. <laughs> you can, the word right is sensitive, so it's just let it happen. Just let it happen. Let it be. <laughs> let it be. We're going through the Beatles. That's great. Uh, any questions? I'm sure there must be. Or comments, indeed. I, anybody who wants to weigh in on this? Well, then I'm going to ask you in the audience a question. Yes, you've, you've just saved the rest of the audience from being asked direct questions by me. <laughs> there you go. Um, thanks. I'm uh, Neil Reimer. I'm a venture capitalist, uh, and I'm also on the board of Human Rights Watch. Um, a question for Victorio. So one of, one of your powers as a CEO is to also influence other constituencies other than just employees, like suppliers or or bankers, or even customers. How do you think about imposing this, this acceptance or, or influencing this type of change across that boundary and, and with your constituencies? We, we do it. We do it. And I have to tell you, we are not heroes in doing it, because we are so big and we buy so much from them that they better align. <laughs> <laughs> so it's easy. How, how do you do it? It's a different issue. How do we do it, for example, with our partners, real partners, i.e. people who are associated with Vodafone, with their brand, and sometimes they are in delicate parts of the world, we have to do that as well. So for example, at some point, somebody in an African country who was carrying our brand started advertising in a homophobic or mostly homophobic type of publication, magazine, and so on. We intervened. We said, sorry, this would be for us a cause for pulling away the brand. Now, of course, they took us very seriously. Because they said, oh my God, this is real. You need to be able to do that step, yeah. which is actually, the, the real thing would be for smaller companies than mine to have the same influence. It, it's a little bit more difficult. But we have to do it. We, we talk about this because, again, we don't want to make it a conflictual thing. We just want to say, hey, this is how our people, our 120,000 people look at the world. It would be very hard for me to justify that, I don't know, I make it up, it's not the case, Ericsson or, or does not follow the same principles. So if we all did it, especially the big guys, that's why I keep referring to other CEOs, uh, it would spread much uh, in, a, in a much quicker way. Mm. And you can also do it at your level, by the way. Zaid, you Doesn't wanted to add something? Y yeah, if I, I, I could ac add to that. Um, coming out of the free and equal campaign, um, we launched uh, a few months ago in New York, and Accenture was the, the lead company doing this, um, a, a global standards for uh, conduct when it comes to LGBTI. And it basically contains five broad principles. Uh, one is to, uh, at all times, observe human rights, the international standard. Uh, two, in the workplace, to end discrimination, um, and also provide support for those who uh, are coming out in affirmative en environment. Uh, three, uh, in the marketplace uh, at the level of distributor, supplier, uh, to uh, abide by human rights uh, values. And four, then, in the community, act in the public sphere and set uh, a good example. 47 uh, big companies signed up right away. And just here in the last few days, we had a whole list of other banks and companies signing up. So this is really good. I mean, we're on to something really good. Mm -hmm. and, and using you know, also Vodafone's uh, leadership, no matter what uh, Vittorio <laughs> says about not being successful in this area. But I mean, we want to encourage others to be the same. And, uh, and if we can build this, uh, this campaign, then smaller companies will feel empowered to raise these issues as well. Yeah. Next question. Yes, <laughs> gentleman there at the back. So I'm Joe Nader with Chevron, and I'd like to build on the question here. Um, I'm curious, and I know you can't give the countries, but I'd be curious to know the conversations you've had with other governments to affect change and what has been successful in terms of those conversations and perhaps what has not been. I have to be honest. We have them very quietly and not too much. We think that the real better way, best way for us is to create coalitions with other companies like yours, like Unilever, like a uh, good thing, and then let this, a little bit following uh, the, the kind of uh, give them time approach, 
Because again, think about the example I gave in the country that I cannot name, inside my embassy, i.e. my company, there has been a debate. I can guarantee to you, I was surprised to hear this mm -hmm. because you know it's not a country where easily debate happens. Actually, when it happens, it can end up in very bad space. But we are influencing now, whatever, two, 3,000 people, and this influence will go, and then other companies have immediately contacted us, and because of course people talk, and then, and so, so we, a direct conversation would be difficult. I, I don't see myself going and saying something and being productive. They will tell me, you don't understand my culture, your the religion, whatever. And, and instead, I believe more in an influence where at some point things happen and you know they say, you know what, let's say face, we don't talk. And then eventually legislative change happens. Now in Western countries, I mean, I was particularly you know, not happy to look at the list of the countries, the map, and see, for example, Italy, which I thought was okay, actually still has pretty a vacuum of uh, legislation, pretty big. So there I can have more of, of, of an influence. But in those where it's banned, uh, you have to be careful. You need to, pro because otherwise there's an impact, there could be an impact on people. So you are playing an active debate, an active role in the Western debate, so the US, We We, UK, we take yeah. positions, open. I mean, I'm giving a speech next week in the UK. I mean, it's in the place where it's legal, of course you can take a position. In the place where it's not legal, a private company taking a position could be seen as colonialistic, imperialistic, um, insensitive, whatever, all those things. So you have to be a little bit uh, uh, more careful. Next question. No, yes, there. More, more of an uh, observation of what we do, which is very powerful, and that's the power of storytelling. So when you get someone, particularly a senior person, standing up on a panel like this and saying, I'm gay and this is my story, um, that has, mm -hmm far more impact than me sending emails around saying LGBT this and surveys and this, that and the other. So mm. when you get someone who's brave enough to do that, like you say, it's, it's more than just wearing the badge, it's actually telling the story. And that, to my mind, is, is hugely impactful. Mm. Have you, and, and do you have, has your company, so you um, so, uh, I'm, I'm Paul Rollins from Baker McKenzie Law Firm. We, we operate in 47 countries. We have the same issues as how to be sensitive in some countries but getting a panel of partners on the stage, often with mixed um, mm -hmm. diversity issues, gender, ethnicity, LGBT issues, sometimes all of the above, that's not necessarily apparent to the audience until they speak. Um, and, um, and we have uh, regional meetings and partners are just gobsmacked when they see people on the stage prepared to talk about this stuff. And it, it, switches, a, it switches the culture almost instantly because mm -hmm. people then feel free to be able to speak about it. Could, could I, I, I think it's a very powerful point that you make and, and undoubtedly true. There are also techniques that one can use. I mean, no one wants to be discriminated against. I, I was briefing a group of African and Arab Islamic states at one stage. And uh, an ambassador, the ambassador of Nigeria said, Hi, Commissioner, we're not going to support your positions on other issues because of your stand on, on this. Uh, we find it offensive to uh, African culture, to Islamic culture, and, uh, and quite frankly, you're out of place talking about it here. So I immediately asked for the floor. The, the South Africans were chairing. I said, I need to respond right away. And I said to the ambassador, I said, look, last two weeks, I've been extremely vocal in defense of migrant rights in Europe. And there are those people on the far right who believe that somehow migrants are less deserving of, of their rights as opposed to others in the same community. And I'm defending them. You're not defending them. I'm defending them. I'm going out press conferences and interviews. Do you want me to stop defending them? Because these people come from your countries. You know, no one wants to be discriminated against uh, well, on the basis of color, creed, nationality, ethnicity, uh, you know, sexual orientation, or, or the like. And so the man then came up to me afterwards and he said, look, I apologize. I shouldn't have said this. Mm. You know, and I was wrong to say it. And so we have to sort of all help each other and use you know, any business practice, any human uh, example that can change people's mindsets. We need to share these stories with each other and then employ them in, in societies where we think it's going to be difficult to make, uh, make change. So... But clearly what you said is absolutely right. But just, again, another example, for example, here I can name the country. 
we were uh, told, oh, be careful, Germany is so conservative. Blah, blah. We did, our German team, as soon as we discussed the issue, did a commercial, a, a TV commercial, based on a uh, transgender situation. Actually, it was loved by the employees, by the customers. When you say customers, I mean, of course, we all see the results of the elections in Germany, and we know that there must be a certain percentage of people that, but we didn't have any backlash. So again, all these small things help then get the courage to, so debate is important, it's very yeah. important. Yeah. And you'll be surprised how much more open people are than what sometimes you assume. Debate and the power of storytelling. And yeah. Jingqing, you, you, ha you, the I power can share you one story, my personal story. You know, I'm constantly challenging the Chinese uh, social boundary, male to female, bring the modern dance to China mm -hmm. and become a single mother with three adopted children single mother with three children. Then finally, after four years, I met my life partner, a German gentleman who's working for a French company in Shanghai. When we start dating, and the regional director of the French company know they are his employee dating a Chinese transgender and call him to the office. He said, be careful. You are dating such a woman, maybe ruining our company reputations. Hmm. A French guy. Luckily, my partner is my husband sitting in the corner, yeah. German. Yeah. And <laughs> next day, he quit the company. Yeah. He quit. Yeah. Then we become together. He become my life partner, helped me raise the three innocent, beautiful children. Ironically, after 10 years, this company, French company, I don't want to mention the name, huge company, <laughs> celebrating the 300 years, you know, business successful in the world in Shanghai. Then they dare to ask me hosting the events. <laughs> <laughs> because they were looking for the number one host in China. They asked me. I was standing there. I can easily use my words teasing about the CEO who's criticized about my partner who's dating me. Then I said, I'm kind enough. I have much more bigger heart. I said, I thank you for the company. Bring the incredible business to share with Chinese. Also, I thank you for you bring the wonderful man to my life. Yeah. <laughs> That's I only can see. So time, life changing. Even I did. I, then one day I was running, I will often fly to Europe. One day I was sitting in the same air from the first class with the jerk. <laughs> <laughs> Who criticized about him. He was sitting there, I look at me. He was a whole 12 hours blushing. I look at him. I said, how dare you criticize? <laughs> so small. Then I feel like a good, I won. <laughs> <laughs> I share the story. Does anybody else either have a question or a comment or want to share a personal story? Because it is, these are incredibly powerful stories. I mean, that's a particularly powerful story, but even a, a more modest story, because this is, a subject where sharing those those stories is extraordinarily helpful. This is a shy Davos crowd. <laughs> <laughs> really? Nobody has anything that they want to continue? Thank you. Well, just thank you all for being here. We are. <clears throat> thank you all for being here. Um, you're modeling behavior and leadership that is encouraging and inspiring. Thank you. That is, yes. I have a short story, but it's really a question for Vittorio. So my name's Eleanor. I run an organization called Water for People. Before that, I, my last job was in a corporate who will not be named. And one of my roles, I was running the water business, but one of my roles was to set up the diversity and inclusion program from zero. So I was really excited. I've been doing this my whole life and at, an, at a previous company, so this was a new job for me. And worked with the CEO and the senior leadership team. And what happened? was it didn't work because the senior leadership team didn't buy into it. They didn't think it was their job to lead. They didn't feel comfortable, that long road to really believing and leading. And I'm wondering how you did that and did you have those same obstacles and how did you find the right champions to become the allies and lead the, the organization to where you are today? I guess I have good colleagues, <laughs> this is the answer. <laughs> I believe that there is an interesting link because I, I didn't explain this. What I really was onto from the beginning was the women thing. And so our company has started on women, 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 women. You know, practically I did it 
also in other companies. But you know, when I became CEO, I said, okay, this is going to be my thing. So in a way, that has prepared the 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 whole, if you want, the why, the all human beings, the human rights. I have to say, I respectfully disagree with some, all those people who say diversity is good because you make more money in the business. I think it's a, an intellectual flow because if I could demonstrate the opposite, would that be a justification for not mm. having? No, exactly. Oh, come on. Mm -hmm. It's good because it's good, because it's a human right, because it's a, it's a principle, it's not a business thing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. after five years of you know, doing that, when, this whole, when, I, when I got the awareness, because some colleagues woke me up and said, they tell you, you think we are perfect, we are not, then probably it was already pre so that, because it goes under the same thing. It's human beings, human rights. You know, I love all human beings. That's it. So it was easy. Then the second thing, it's very important to find uh, some very enthusiastic champions and not necessarily uh, my first reports, my first lines. My first lines might have some of the same concerns that sometimes, you know, top people have, you know, I can do that. You always find enthusiastic, usually second lines. I have 25 of those. I have 25 directors who are really seen as champions. Then their bosses become a little bit jealous because these guys are very good, and then suddenly they, they all jump in. And, and, and again, you cre and, and it's the same across all topics in companies. You always need 20, 25 people, and it's not more than that, who are really enthusiastic, and that contaminates up and down. But mm. the real honest answer is we were so much on the women thing that it, this was just a normal, logical, you know, completion almost. So you wanted to add something, and I think disagree, which yeah, is... Yeah, I'd like to disagree with them, because... Happy. The, it is true that on its own merits, diversity needs to be defended and promoted. Uh, but all of us, I don't believe that the great Nelson Mandela was right when he thought, when he said that we were all born without discrimination. We are the products of our genes. The, our forebears uh, lived in climates where there was great uh, intolerance. And uh, it's rather the opposite, that we have within us an immediacy sometimes to jump to conclusions on the basis of appearance or color. And then we constantly have to fight this. And any mechanism we can use to turn keys and unlock doors. So a, a CEO who comes from a conservative uh, sort of culture, you may need to start the approach from it's good for business. And then eventually he will see how ridiculous the, or, or she will see how ridiculous the position was in the beginning and realize that on its own merit, having a diverse... Uh, uh, yeah. can, can, can I, I had a discussion with McKinsey on this. Okay. Because McKinsey have this report <laughs> yes. that I recommend to everybody on, yeah. on, on uh, uh, equality and so on. It is true that it helps, that type of that approach type of helps with the CEO. Because yeah. if you say to the CEO, listen, maybe you are not completely convinced, but it helps your business, it gives you the justification with the board, with everything yeah. else. The problem with that approach is that if you go in a reality like mine, which is really multi-country, you might end up with somebody who says, okay, can I prove to you that is not good for yeah. business? Okay. Because the culture, the military, this Language and that. And so forth. Then what do you say? You say, okay, don't do the embassy in your country. He says, no, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm manage it, like all problems, manage it with intelligence. But you need to find an ethical reason, not a absolutely. business reason, yeah, to push back on this yeah. gene thing. Absolutely. It's ethical. I ironically, one of my LGBT colleagues told me, it's very strange, you're Italian, you're probably Catholic. And I said, well, maybe it's because I'm Catholic mm. that I really think that I should love everybody. So you, you really need to go at the very principle, highly principle, yeah. truly Catholic, I would have to say, <laughs> in the good way. Uh, uh, no, seriously, you have to stay at that level to really be universal. Yeah. Then, okay, then we modulate in a different ways, yeah, different I agree. countries, different things. I agree. So I don't think we completed that. I agree. No, so no, it's I a agree. question of which of the approaches you emphasize in a particular situation. That yeah. depends on the local guys. That depends. So that's no, why my job is to establish the principle. Yeah. And again, the ethical principle. Then I have to respect culture, I have to respect yes. speed, I have to, but if I'm convinced that my local guys are con really buying into the principle, then I can have the trust that when the, hap the issue happens, you know, in, in that country, or, or, there will be a positive debate. And then they will find a solution, which is not the same that I find in London or I find in Amsterdam, because obviously in London and in Amsterdam, it's easier to handle certain things than in X. Mm. Thanks, Brent. One more, yes. 
how do you measure or monitor the things that are working in, in your company? And you spoke that you started with gender. Can you speak a little bit about the intersection between what you've done to achieve gender equality and how that intersects with well, what I'm you're an, doing? I'm a number person. I like, uh, at the end of the day, I like measurements. I like, as I said, I started by saying, thank you for saying we did a good job, but 89 is not a good job. So uh, next survey, I want uh, 93, 95, 97, 99, 100. Same thing with, which is very difficult. Also, also another very, it's another panel. You know, uh, female participation. We started 17, 21, 22, 28, now 28, 28, and we are not going up anymore. So we all have a problem. How do I get to 30, 35? Uh, in the end, it's measuring. We put aspirational targets, but then you need to give time. So it's a combination of, I want a target, but I give you time. I want a target, but I give you time. And then you discuss why you're not reaching the target. And then you find out what the problem is and you mm. try to remove the problem. It's a very long journey, and that's why my job is to stay at the principal level. But just to be clear, the metric you use for LGBT progress is the survey that asks your employees, do you feel comfortable the, in this organization? Like, like everything, Zani, in life, it's, it's about metrics and then going around and talking and mm -hmm. understanding what the problem is. Mm -hmm. So metrics is, I would like to have my 100% of people feeling comfortable. I would like to have at my meetings, not the small percentage that I have today of people who openly come, because I know that it's statistically impossible. Mm -hmm. I, I should be at a higher percentage, mm -hmm. but I'm not. Mm. So why? But then I cannot force everybody to say, I'm declaring right, exactly. it. They need to have their time, exactly. whatever, for whatever reason. And then I go around and I do these meetings and I ask and I call these people and say, how is it going? What do we do right? What do we do wrong? And then I hear the new story. I don't know, I'll take a picture with you if you allow me and I will put it tonight into my own thing. So it's a combination of hard and soft, like everything in life. But you need to have an ambition on a hard number. Mm. This is also like a give and taking situation. Mm -hmm. You've been uh, surrounded and doesn't clarify, you make other people comfortable. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you really receive the comfort for yourself. If sometimes this really always for me to works very well, everybody knows, oh, Jinxing is coming, Jinxing is coming. Everybody thinks she's extremely, you know, diva and uh, very, very extravagant, you know, all of the pictures. But when I come here, people say, oh, she's so quiet and like, no, I'm like us. I say, yes, mm -hmm. what's big different? <laughs> then feel, feel, okay. We're just thinking about what's the Jinxin real image about. If we heard to be net, the thinking is so wild. Then I think also the most giving and take. Whatever situation I go, I make everybody feel comfortable. When my stage is there, I open my mouth, I dancing, I talk. If not my stage, I quietly listening, observing beautifully, just like everybody. You make mutual respect and understanding that's make your life easier. Mm. For the LGBT group, I always say that you have to make everybody comfortable, comfortable. then you will get comfort. Mm. Do you have, when you come to places like Davos, when you come and you, you come outside of China, do you have a, is there a different reaction to inside China? No, me? I'm the, I have the nickname called Crystal Fish. Mm. That's why Chinese people love me because the, on camera, on stage, even here, I'm still the same person. I'm not the kind of double layer artist. Mm -hmm. One face for my country, one face for the outside world. No, because of the power of me is the truth, mm -hmm. the honesty. Mm -hmm. I speak everything. We have a positive side about our country, what's happening in the international states world. We have an internal issue with Chinese need to fix in the, to dealing with it. It's frankly, that's why my show, in three years time, first the Chinese TV show can bring the three generation from five years old, 100 years old, together watching the program. That was a big influence, also scaring for everybody. So then I said, okay, I didn't, that's my, not my intention, but I think that's already passive attitude, how we can achieve, how we can uh, encourage the young people to mm -hmm. deal in your own situation. Yeah. Go ahead, you wanted yeah. to say one more thing. I, the, there's a very powerful experience I had not long ago when I was in, um, in Guatemala and I was meeting with civil society there. And I'm so used to meeting with civil society where every community has a representative speaking on their behalf. So the indigenous persons had a, someone who would speak and on, about indigenous issues, persons with disabilities and, and the like. Well, this meeting was different because the LGBT community was represented by someone from the indigenous community. Uh, the uh, uh, women's empowerment group was actually representing the views of the indigenous community. In other words, they all decided to represent 
another community's views. And I found it so powerful that, and I wonder within companies or uh, in communities, if we did more of that, where it's not each group just fighting for their own rights, but the rights of others, yes. and others will fight for yours as well. Yes. And that becomes yes. a very powerful motivator, yes. I think, for all of us. Yes. Yeah. We have time probably for one last brief question. Yes. Briefly. Um, Andrea Vanelli from Science Gala International. I work a lot with universities, and actually in universities the situation is much worse because about f just over 50% of the students that are uh, LGBT come out. Mm -hmm. That has indeed bad influence on all kind of uh, um, mm -hmm. metrics. Um, one of the things that Science Gallery in CERN and, and Royal Society are doing this year is to launch an international day for LGBT in STEM, mm -hmm. like there is a day for women in STEM to recognize and to give visibility. Are there mm -hmm. other um, instruments that we can use to promote indeed the visibility, the role models um, mm -hmm. of uh, LGBT people in research and, and STEM fields? Vittorio, mm -hmm. those are probably many of your future employees. <laughs> 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 Honestly, it's a good thought. I never, we, of course we do girls, we do girls with coding, girls code like a girl, all these things. Um, honestly, it's a good thought. I, I react by saying thank you for a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that is a very positive, action-oriented, and therefore World Economic Forum-y-ish place to end. Uh, a really fascinating discussion. Thank you to three extraordinary individuals. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.